Y'all, are the parents of famous influencers okay? Can I get a... So remember Addison Rae, famous TikToker, came under fire last week because of the father, son, holy spirit, uh, bikini. Well, this a hunk of midlife crisis man meat is her father, Monty. Monty is going through something a little bit weird right now. So reportedly at some point in the last year, Addison's parents split up, which is only notable because they have been featured a number of times in her content. With Addison's mom, Sherry, especially gaining a massive audience of over 14 million followers. And here's the thing, there are all these claims that Monty cheated on Sherry. I don't, I don't care about any of that. Yes, it would make what's happening extra cringy, but Let's just talk about what we definitively know. They're split up and then apparently a certain someone finds wind that Sherry is single. Turns out it's musical artist and lover of all things mom, Young Gravy. I do have a thing for milk. Moms need love, underservice community. Yeah, that's right. And now this stuff with Addison Ray's mom came about. Mm -hmm. Is that real or is that a meme? It's real. Really? It's real. It's real. Interesting. She's, she's recently single. We're going on a date soon. The only thing is that she lives in Louisiana. Let's picture your first date. Addison Ray's mom. Something real, real classy. With Monty Lopez then responding in multiple videos saying, I wanna fight young Gravy. To which Gravy just left a comment laughing, and Monty not realizing the L he just took, going, but can we set it up? And I will say, if you're looking for a great, just like mental break for five minutes from the, the dark internet, just go through those comments, it's a great time. Though some of those comments and the replies to them have created other branching stories from this. Like for example, you had creator and OnlyFans influencer Tana Mojo getting into the mix, commenting, I'm calling the police. To which Monty responds, by by slut shaming Tana and saying about your body count. With Tana then responding by making a video talking about him uh, taking certain substances up his nose and such. Also captioning the video, Monty, please allow me to collect the receipts and follow up. Disgusting. Well, the 10% of my brain that absolutely loves internet messiness is excited to see what comes next. The rest of my brain kind of sees this Monty situation as just yet another example of the, the messiness that can come from influencers' parents. It's just that Lopez's especially stands out because his daughter is one of the biggest creators in the world, who's also in the midst of her own controversy already, and Monty Monty is especially loud about his bullshit, coming off like a, a roid ragey tries to fuck his daughter's friends sort of uh, midlife crisis guy. And understand, I'm not saying he does those things, but that's the energy he seems to be coming at people with right now. I don't know, y'all, fucking fame is a hell of a drug. And this money guy just appears to have overdosed on it. Also, Monty, my guy, you know you're just making this more fun for gravy, right? He was just being respectful when he was laughing at you. Because without a doubt, this guy's got some zingers in his back pocket. Right? He could have easily said, no, thank you. I'm only interested in smashing one of Addison's parents. But he didn't because he's a gentleman. He's gonna take your ex out for a nice seafood dinner. Anyway, to everyone else, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm gonna be splitting $10,000 across 10 lucky subscribe beautiful bastards this month. And let's just keep this show going. And then we should definitely talk about this really interesting story about the US prison system. So the Washington Post publishes investigation on prison officials and the administration of court order victim fees paid out by inmates. And drawing from documents and interviews, the Post reported that the Federal Bureau of Prisons has been pushing back against efforts to make inmates pay much more of their restitution in part because the money they would use helps fund salary and benefits of hundreds of agency staff positions. And reportedly records show that the BOP pays out many salaries and benefits from a pool of money they call the trust fund, which as it turns out comes from inmate commissary accounts that prisoners use to make commissary purchases or buy access to phone calls. And not only does the Bureau significantly mark up the prices it charges inmates to pay for staff, it also charges interest on the fund. Where just last year alone, the BOP used $82 million earned from inmate commissary purchases to fund 652 positions within the agency. So already you had people saying, this is clearly sketchy and obviously ripe for abuse. But you have others adding where the sketch train really jumps off the tracks is when you consider how inmates get the money for their commissary accounts in the first place. Or that money comes from separate funds called deposit accounts, which inmates are allowed to keep unlimited amounts of money in and which are subject to almost no regulations. But those deposit accounts are also used to pay their court ordered victim fees, meaning they're drawing from the same pool of money to pay restitution and to transfer funds to the commissary accounts that are then used to pay the salaries of prison employees. And so as a result, critics say this creates a conflict of interest for the BOP because it incentivizes them to shield the money in the deposit accounts that should go to the restitution or child support. And that's actually something that's been highlighted recently in a number of high profile cases. With the post revealing that very famous inmates like the Boston Bomber and Larry Nassar had huge prison accounts, but have actually paid very little of what they owed to their victims. Or as it turns out, before a judge issued an order forcing the BOP to turn over more significant payments, Nassar had only
only paid out about $100 a year to victims he owed tens of thousands of dollars to, even though he had spent more than $10,000 on other purchases. Meanwhile, sources have said that how or if the Justice Department decides to set new rules could affect another high-profile case. We're talking about R. Kelly, because somehow he has a whopping $28,000 in his prison account, but has not been ordered to pay any of the $140,000 he owes in court-ordered fines. And in addition to that, in one absolutely insane case that really highlights how fucked this all is, a bank robber literally wrote to a federal judge saying the BOP was preventing him from paying his victims what he owed and asking the judge to intervene. Now, notably here, the deputy attorney general has been trying to reform this system, reportedly debating in early July how much to increase the amount inmates have to pay toward court judgments each month. But according to the Post, the BOP has argued for years that regardless of how much money an inmate has, they should only be required to pay out $25 every three months to their victims. That's literally just over $8 a month. And sources familiar with last month's deliberations on increasing the amount of restitution, they said the prison officials argued that the BOP shouldn't substantially increase the amount of victims' fees prisoners were ordered to pay. And this because those officials allegedly claimed that reducing the amount of money in the accounts could also reduce the amount in the trust fund, thus cutting into the agency's revenue. So it's going to be really interesting to see what change the Justice Department ultimately decides to make here and whether it's actually going to make a difference. And then, over the weekend, I slipped into a creek, which is why I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Vessi. Because not looking where you're going and tripping into a creek sucks bad, but it sucks a little bit less because of my Vessis. Seriously, if they weren't already, Vessis would now be my favorite lightweight shoes. Where they actually keep your feet warm and dry through the rain and sandproof for all those summer beach days. They're built for everyday life. And Vessi makes 100% waterproof and snowproof sneakers that are incredibly comfortable, breathable, and actually pretty stylish. It's a great addition to any wardrobe. They became my go-to when traveling. They're lightweight, and it's just one less decision you need to make when vacationing places with ever-changing weather. Whether it be unexpected downpours or uh, falling into bodies of water, which apparently is a thing I do now. Whether it be because you got back to school shopping around the corner or just for whatever reason, you can't go wrong for the whole family with Vessi's The Weekend Sneakers with their easy on-off pull tab. And don't forget, they're washable. So make Vessi's the go-to shoes by your door and go to Vessi.com slash DeFranco to get $25 off each pair of adult Vessi shoes. Trust me, you need a pair of Vessi's. And then in, depending on your opinion, fantastic or batshit crazy horrible news, let's talk about North Carolina. And that's because today, North Carolina is trying to be a bit more like Texas, specifically in regards to the problem of school shootings, because North Carolina is trying to get more guns in schools. With Madison County Sheriff Buddy Hardwood stocking each of his county's six schools, including three elementary schools with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. With him saying these are locked away in safes, along with breaching tools for barricaded doors, and they're meant to be used by school resource officers in case of a shooting. And Hardwood argues this is necessary because of how unreliable the law enforcement in Uvalde turned out to be, saying those officers were in that building for so long, and that suspect was able to infiltrate that building and injure and kill so many kids. I just want to make sure my deputies are prepared in the event that happens. And with that saying, that school resource officers have been training with instructors from the community college AB Tech, which was interesting for me to see, because that's literally the, the first college I ever went to. But, you know, with this story, while of course we have many people who say they want more guns in school, saying they're soft targets, you also had many seeing this news going, what the fuck? Like this UNC Chapel Hill professor who has studied school safety for decades reacting. I thought it was a joke. I really thought that this was just some fake news. It's what we call hardening in the schools, and it's what's going to happen is that we're going to have um, accidents with these guns. With them adding that SROs actually bring more violence to schools, not less, with arrests of students and physical altercations. And there is some research that suggests that having guns in school creates risk. With Giffords Law Center reporting nearly 100 publicly reported incidents of mishandled guns in school during the last five years, including in which a student grabbed an officer's firearm while he tried to subdue them. And while with this story online, people are loving it, they're hating it, and of course I want to pass the question off to you, what are your thoughts here? Madison schools start the fall semester on August 22nd, so we're going to see how this plays out. Though, hopefully we hear nothing, because if we do, it's because something else horrible probably happened. And then, in absolutely massive political news, the Senate appears to have actually done a thing. And specifically, we're talking about Senate Democrats passing a sweeping $740 billion climate, healthcare, and tax bill. And I say Democrats because this was literally party lines, 50-50 with Vice President Harris making the tie-breaking vote. But the Democrats were able to pass the bill despite united Republican opposition through the process known as reconciliation, where they were able to skirt around the 60-vote filibuster because the Senate is allowed to pass budget measures with a simple majority. But this is reportedly all made possible because majority leader Chuck Schumer finally reached an agreement with Senator Joe Manchin, who, as we've talked about, and once again, it is not hyperbolic to say he has pretty much single-handedly held up the party's agenda for months. While you may have seen this news over the weekend, I wanted to talk about it more because there are good and bad things depending on your points of view. Right, so very significantly, the bill dubbed the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 would authorize the largest federal investment for efforts to combat climate change in American history, and this by allocating more than $370 billion into climate and energy programs, with officials saying that the legislation could cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 2005 levels by the end of the decade.
decade, which notably is just short of Biden's initial 50% goal. And among other measures, the package will achieve this by allocating $30 billion to the production of solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and other critical minerals processing, providing $10 billion to build facilities that manufacture products like electric cars and solar panels, setting aside $500 million for heat pumps and additional critical minerals processing through the Defense Production Act, giving $60 billion to assist disadvantaged areas that are disproportionately impacted by climate change, incentivizing consumers to invest in renewable energy, including through tax breaks on both new and used electric vehicles, and imposing a new fee on oil and gas companies for excessive methane emissions. Also, in addition to the climate change portions of the bill, there are a number of other incredibly significant provisions that cover other major Democratic goals, especially regarding health care, this including by allowing Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription medications with drug makers for the first time ever, a move that is projected to save the federal government billions of dollars. Though, notably here, that would only apply to 10 drugs starting in 2026, but expand to include additional drugs later. The bill would also impose a $2,000 annual cap on out-of-pocket prescription drug costs for people on Medicare and ensure that seniors have access to free vaccination. Another measure would extend the Affordable Care Act subsidies included in last year's pandemic relief package that were initially set to expire this year, with those being kept in place until 2025. And as far as how this plan will be paid for, Democrats proposed a series of reforms to boost tax revenue, with the most significant of which being the creation of a 15% minimum tax for corporations that report incomes of $1 billion or more, with that alone predicted to bring in over $300 billion in revenue. The bill also aims to give the IRS $80 billion more for stricter enforcement and compliance, a move the government officials say will provide $203 billion more in revenue over a decade. It would also impose a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks, which would raise around $74 billion over the next decade. So we're seeing a lot of major, long-standing Democratic goals here. But, you didn't think there was going to be a but, this is politics. It's incredibly important to mention all the concessions that party leaders had to make to get this. And that's including all the things that were not in this package. Right? Because it's not like Manchin just out of nowhere had to change a heart here. They had to seriously change this thing. This including by cutting incredibly important measures to provide free pre-kindergarten for all and paid family and medical leave for workers all over the country. Additionally, the party had to grant some big concessions to Manchin, including agreeing to proposals that run counter to their climate goals. Like, for example, allowing new oil and gas leasing in the Gulf of Mexico and the Alaskan coast, as well as a commitment that the party will pursue separate measures in the future to complete a natural gas pipeline in Manchin State and make it easier for developers to skirt some environmental protections. Also, Manchin wasn't the only person the Democrats had to make concessions to. Right? How could you forget her? Senator Kirsten Cinema. Remember that when she had her little John McCain moment? Well, Cinema was able to use all that concern about her to force party leaders to scale back tax policies, and specifically those that aim to increase tax rates on some of the wealthiest corporations and individuals in America. But also, in addition to that, some of the biggest omissions from the final package weren't the fault of Mansion or Cinema. Republicans successfully blocked a provision that could have capped the price of insulin at just $35 for patients on private insurance after challenging the measure as a violation of Senate rules under the reconciliation process. You know, because fuck people that need cheap insulin, I guess. That's how we'll make our presence be known. Also, with all this, some people have said that the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't actually do enough to reduce inflation plaguing Americans. And actually there, while many experts have said that the bill will likely have little or no effect on inflation for the remaining months of this year, it is expected to bring it down in the medium and long term. With some noting that in addition to the climate, healthcare, and tax policies, the bill would also invest around $300 billion in deficit reduction, which can help reduce inflationary pressures. Beyond that, others have argued that there aren't enough protections to ensure that corporations now facing tax hikes won't just pass those burdens on to consumers or cut worker benefits. While we're going to have to wait to see how those specific things play out, many have said that when taken all together, the various elements of this plan will help working families, small businesses, and others. But that's where we are now. This now heads off to the House, where it's expected to pass and be sent over to Biden's desk. But yeah, ultimately, that is where we are right now, and the, the timing here is significant. One, because when it comes to the climate, sooner rather than later is the best bet. Two, there's talk about will this help the Democrats coming into the midterms? Like now they get to go, hey, we did a thing despite Cinema and Mansion. But also, three, this was really kind of a now or never for Democrats. Even though post Roe v. Wade being overturned, we've seen shifting in the polls, it is still more likely than not that Republicans are at the very least going to take over the House. Senate is more of a toss-up, currently leaning more towards the Democrats, but we're gonna have to wait to see. You know, without a doubt, if the Democrats lose just one chamber, nothing's getting passed, at least for the two years going into the 2024 election. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, being a part of that conversation down below, being subscribed for these daily dives into the news, which if you want more news, I got you covered here. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.